Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. Someone once said, Revenge is a dish best served cold. My mind wandered as I sat in the 24-hour dinner. I had been sitting in the booth near the window since 2 a.m. It was now 5 a.m. My mind was turning over and over and I just couldn't sleep, so I sat in the dinner drinking coffee. In my briefcase was the private detective's report. It detailed all the times my loving wife had cheated on me in the last six months. It also contained video in 8 by 10 photos of these events. It was a very thick folder. I was waiting for my lawyer's office to open. I had the first appointment of the day. As I sat there, I thought about my life. When I was 10 and my sister was 6, they took us out of class one afternoon. We were taken to the principal's office. There sat my uncle Vito and his wife. Our mother and father had been killed in a traffic accident that morning. They were here to take us to their home. My Uncle Vito and his wife were not really relatives of ours. Uncle Vito was actually my mother's godfather, but he was all the relation we had. And he was making sure that my sister and I had a loving home to go to. Actually, Uncle Vito didn't have a home. He had an estate. But as a kid, I didn't understand the difference. Uncle Vito's house was on 20 acres of lush grass in the best part of the county. There were barns with horses, a huge pool, guest house, and much more. The whole estate was surrounded by a huge wall. There even was a gate across the driveway with an armed guard. There were also armed guards walking the wall. Uncle Vito liked his privacy. I didn't know it then, but Uncle Vito was the head of one of the largest crime families in the U.S. Because of his security, rivals just couldn't get to him. But they did arrange for my mother's and father's accident. It was meant to be a message to him. I found out later, there was a terrible price paid by attacking Vito's family. Within the next two years, Everybody associated with that crime syndicate and their friends and families disappeared. Uncle Vito had sent his return message. He annexed their businesses. My sister and I grew up in that wonderful home. We were surrounded by friends and family. We looked upon our cousins as if they were brothers and sisters. We were a family. Once done with my schooling, I had an MBA, and I was working at a small company my uncle seemed to own, although I couldn't actually find any paperwork that indicated he did. One day, he called me into his study and asked me to do him a favor. It seems that he had been accessing my progress over the last few years and felt I was ready for more. He had just come into possession of a small restaurant in the suburbs. He asked if I would like to learn the restaurant business because he wanted to turn it over to me. I wasn't a blood relative. He couldn't take me into the family businesses with my cousins, but he wanted to make sure I had something. I said yes. One didn't turn down Uncle Vito. And my career as a restaurateur began. It was an instant success, maybe because all of Vito's friends started eating there. But soon, it caught on with regular people and I was off and running. One day a distant relative showed up with blueprints. It seemed that Uncle Vito wanted the size of the restaurant doubled by adding a large party room. Construction started the next day. Remember what Uncle Vito wanted, Uncle Vito got. I guess I could have been put out by the way they just started building, without any of my input. But then I wasn't paying for anything either. I just went with the flow. Once the construction was finished and everything was progressing nicely, I got so busy that I couldn't think straight. The party room was very popular with my uncle and friends. The doors were thick and the walls were soundproof. Sometimes he brought family and friends to dine there, including all the wives and children. Other times there were just groups of very hard-looking men behind those closed doors. They entered and left via the external entrance which was designed to accommodate the arrival of wedding parties. Only these weren't wedding parties. They were some of the heads of the largest crime families in the U.S. Whenever they showed up, my regular wait staff suddenly had the night off, with pay, and were replaced by hard men with bulges under their coats. My regular customers seemed not to notice the changes. The only thing I noticed is that none of my regular customers would complain about anything those nights. One night my uncle was entertaining another gentleman, from the West Coast, and his family. They were as close to being friends as could be considering their occupations. One of my uncle's associates stopped me in the main restaurant and said that, at my leisure, my uncle would like to introduce me to his friend. While I didn't actually drop everything and come running, I didn't keep Uncle Vito waiting very long. I do have an MBA, you know. I'm not exactly stupid. I soon found myself being introduced to one of the most beautiful women I ever saw. She was your typical Italian beauty. She was about 5 feet 6 inches tall, with a body to die for. She had raven hair about shoulder length, olive skin, deep dark eyes, and was just a few years younger than me. I was so overwhelmed, I made a fool of myself trying to talk. 
I think it was at that point I fell in love with her. Since it was Saturday night, the restaurant was very busy, and I had to excuse myself and return to being the boss. About an hour later, I was, carefully, explaining something to one of the substitute waiters when I saw her leaving the banquet room and start for me. I assumed that there was a problem in the room requiring my attention. I was floored when she explained that she wanted to see how a restaurant was run and asked if I would show her around. So, for the next four hours, I'd like to say that I was suave and sophisticated as I showed her the in and out of the business, but in truth I acted like an idiot. But she acted nice and I thought I might have made a nice impression. The next day, a limo stopped outside my apartment and there she was asking me to show her around the area. She said she was bored hanging around with her father and my uncle and wanted to be with me. We had a wonderful day. She even went to the restaurant with me when it was time to open and stayed until closing. The next couple of days were a repeat, until I was summoned to my uncle's study. Once there he quickly got to the point. He wanted to know my intentions toward his friend's daughter. He explained that his friend was a very protective father and would not allow any fooling around with his daughter. I may have thought I was falling in love, but I was not falling into stupid. For the rest of the week, I kept her at arm's length whenever she showed up. A road trip to L.A. A couple of months later, I was back in the study. Uncle Vito was explaining that his friend's daughter wanted to open an Italian-style restaurant on the West Coast and would I take a couple of months to help them get started. My restaurant just about ran itself, so I accepted. He then gave me the look and told me to have fun, be careful, and remember about protective fathers. When I got to the coast, I found a restaurant exactly like mine, right down to the light fixtures. I was flattered. I spent the next two months helping her get the restaurant up and running. We hired chiefs, waitstaff, dishwashers. We stocked shelves and did all the stuff you need to do to get up and running. Sometime during those two months, we became lovers. We had sex every chance we got. The first time happened when we were all alone in the restaurant. She came out of the ladies' restroom, completely nude except for a pair of high heels. She was beautiful. I forgot all about Uncle Vito's warning about protective fathers. I forgot about everything. I think we tried to christen every table in the dining room, plus the bar. She was insatiable. I could just about walk the next day. She just smiled from ear to ear. We continued until I was forced to return back east. We pledged undying love for each other. Her father gave me his version of the look as I got on the plane to return. One year later, the restaurant was closed. Not as a failure but so that we could hold our wedding reception there. Her father and my Uncle Vito were almost as happy as I was. I guess our marriage cemented our two families and crime empires. We decided to live back east and a manager was selected for her restaurant. She went back to the West Coast four to five times a year to check on the operation of her little restaurant. We had a great life together. Five years later. Five years later, I was just about as happy as I ever expected to be with a loving wife and twin daughters. It was then my life fell apart. I was again summoned to my uncle's study. He poured me a drink, hugged me that same way that he did many years ago when my parents were killed, and handed me a folder. I opened the folder, started looking at the pictures it contained. I started to cry. My wife was having an affair. For the next few hours, I read the report the detective agency had compiled. It seems all the times that I thought my wife was on the coast checking her restaurant, she was actually being the center attraction at gangbangs. It seems that she loved sex with more than one partner. To be more exact, she loved groups consisting of at least 10, sometimes as many as 20 different men. There were men of all races and colors. From looking at the pictures, she didn't discriminate at all. As I looked at the pictures, I saw her doing doubles and triples. The men standing in line waiting their turns. They were in her every hole. She was lying on her back, kneeling on all fours, riding them like a cowgirl. If there was a position, she was in it. She was an equal opportunity gangbang. She would take all comers. There was also a DVD. My uncle explained it was video of some of her sessions in living color and sound. I watched it. In it she was doing things that she had always refused to do with me. Listening to the sound told me she loved every minute of those things. I still remember her yelling, screw me harder. Fill me. Toward the bottom of the folder, there were some medical forms. My uncle explained that they were DNA comparisons of my girl's DNA with mine. They showed that the girls were indeed my daughters and my wife was still clean. No STDs, yet. Then I asked him for a good attorney. He said to wait, not to approach her about her unfaithfulness. He would take care of my problem. There would be no divorces in his family. He also wanted to sit down with her father. My father-in-law would not be pleased. 
The diner. So here I sit in a 24-hour diner, six months later. My wife is on the West Coast again. She had been there the last two weeks. The trip was scheduled to last only one week, but she called extending it. Tommy, the restaurant is a mess. I need to spend extra time to get it straightened out. I offered to come out and help, but she said she could handle it. Remembering the DVD? I thought. I'll bet you can. The waitress refilled my cup, again. I had tipped her $50 to make sure the coffee kept coming. I understand how difficult the overnight shift could be. A police sergeant walked into the dinner and spoke to the waitress a minute. She pointed at me. The sergeant walked over and asked to sit down. He then said, There's no easy way to say this, but your wife's restaurant caught fire and she was badly burned. We have a car outside to take you to the airport. You should have seen his face when I broke out laughing and said, No thanks. I then opened my briefcase and showed him the pictures and explained I had an appointment with a divorce attorney and I would not be taking advantage of his offer of a ride. I was only in this restaurant to kill time until my appointment. He left speaking into his microphone. About an hour later, a detective showed up. He also showed a lot of sympathy, not about my wife being burnt in the fire, but about her having cheated on me. His ex-wife cheated on him also, and he had dumped her. We were part of a brotherhood. He then asked me a lot of questions to establish that I had nothing to do with the fire on the West Coast. Later, one of my uncle's friends slid into the booth across from me. He said, your uncle wants to see you. I explained about the lawyer's appointment, but he said it had already been canceled. An Uncle Vito study. When I got to my uncle's, he explained about the fire. It seems that after the restaurant closed, my wife couldn't wait to get back to the hotel to start her party. She took her clothes off climbed up on one of the banquet tables and started taking on all her staff. To make a long story short, the gas in the kitchen somehow got turned on and not lit. With all activity, no one noticed until it was too late. The gas exploded, killing 30 guys in the resulting fire. There were only 10 restaurant employees. I wonder what the other 20 were doing there. My wife was a survivor. He said her body was covered in something that protected her partially from burns. Come, maybe. And four guys were, around, her body, and that protected her from the debris from the explosion. She was badly disfigured. Her face was badly burned, one ear was gone, most of her nose burned off. It seems that she had breast implants and one exploded leaving her with a partial mastectomy. She was badly burned between her legs. It was presumed that she would never again have any feelings when she had sex. Her father paid for all the hospitalization, but would not pay a dime for any reconstructions caused by the fire, to the restaurant, or to her. When she was ready to be released from the hospital, she tried to call me. She found that I no longer had the old number and my new one was unlisted. She then tried my restaurant, but was told the number was no longer in service. A quick call to directory service confirmed that there was no longer a restaurant called Pasta Villa. She called my uncle, but no one would accept her call. She gave up and called her father. When he realized it was her, he hung up and refused all further calls. She then realized that she was alone now. Her face was so badly disfigured that she wore something like a ski mask whenever she left her small apartment. If she forgot to wear it, small children would scream, and adults would look away. A few months later, she was back in the ER, a failed suicide attempt. She was committed to a state institution for her own protection. It was assumed that she would never regain her sanity. I got the marriage annulled. Eventually, I met another woman. My girls loved her, my uncle loved her, and all the family loved her. We were married about two years after the fire. Among all the gifts, we got a very nice wedding present from my ex-father-in-law. When I called him to thank him for the gift, I explained that I wanted him to continue to be in his granddaughter's lives. And if he couldn't come east to see us, we would be glad to go west to see him. When he was thanking me, I could have sworn I heard his voice break. But I could have been wrong. He was a very hard guy. His nickname was The Fireman. It's a shame his daughter had not remembered that. Now for the second story. I arrived home on a Friday night, thinking that after a tough week on the flight line, I could enjoy myself in the company of my pretty wife, three kids, out of the house and more or less on their own, after 22 years of marriage. Maybe we could go out and have a pleasant evening. My name is David Collins, mild-mannered A&P mechanic and crew chief of arrivals and departures, day shift, for United Airlines, after 25 years of working the garbage shifts. My wife Judith Collins was the charge nurse at Central Hospital, day shift, labor, and delivery. Both of us making good money, me just a little more than her, union, you know, but comfortably upper middle class. I pulled the pickup into the garage, 
in its usual spot, and closed the garage door. If we were going out nice, it would be in her Lincoln Navigator. If it was country slash western night, my F-250 was the chariot of choice. The night would be my wife's choice, wasn't it always? Either way, it didn't bother me. If mama's happy, daddy is ecstatic. I walked into the kitchen from the garage and perused the mail on the kitchen table. I heard a noise upstairs and then the padding of little feet coming down the steps. My attractive 42-year-old wife entered the living room in a shorty robe that never ceased to get me excited when she wore it. Oh, she exclaimed. You're early. I, ah, uh, I didn't expect you for another hour or so. I looked at my watch and realized I was early. But not that early. What gives? Where are we going? Well, I'm going out. I don't know what you are doing. Okay. My weekend just went as shit. What do you mean? You're going out. Where? And with who? Her eyes strayed to the small overnight bag at the end of the couch. I have a date with William Strathmore. It's for the weekend. I'll be home Sunday night, and we will talk about it. What the hell did she just say? I thought. I have to finish getting ready. She turned and raced upstairs, and I heard the door slam. The hell you will, I said. My first thought was I needed reinforcements. I pulled out my cell phone and speed dialed my daughter. I was not going to be made the bad guy by he said, she said. Hello, daddy. What's up? She answered cheerfully. I grabbed her mother's purse and emptied it onto the coffee table. I need you to get over here right away. Your mother hurt her head, and she needs us. I've got to go. Daddy? Dad? I heard as I hung up. The next all was to my number one son. He got the same message, with the included, call your brother and tell him to get here quick. Dad? What the hell? As I ended the call. Then I speed dialed her parents and said the same thing. There was equal confusion at their end and some yelling as I disconnected the call. Judith's pocketbook spilled the usual contents, credit cards, keys, a 12-pack of Trojan condoms. I had had a vasectomy and a confirmation email from the Marriott Hotel in Kenilworth. Room 703 to 710. The hell you will, I thought. William Strathmore was one of the pediatric surgeons at her work. I had met him at the hospital Christmas party several times in the past five years, and the guy was slimy. And that was the best thing I could say about him. His wife was drop-dead gorgeous, but I got the impression she had had it with him. I confiscated her credit cards and her car keys. Then I took the email and put it in my pocket. Just in case. I picked up her cell phone and unlocked it. Her code was our anniversary date, and the number three for our children. Security. She was still busy upstairs, so I got a hold of the emergency call list from her job and looked up the good doctor. His cell phone would not help, but his home phone might. I dialed it, and after two rings, someone answered. Oh, honey, I was waiting for your call. I don't recognize the number, though. Is everything all right? Is this Mrs. Strathmore? I asked. Yes, who is this, please? This is David Collins. My wife is a charge nurse at the hospital where your husband works. I don't know if you remember me. Yes, Dave, as a matter of fact, I do. My husband and I were talking about you and your wife a couple of nights ago. I was expecting a call from William when you rang. What can I do for you? So your husband is not home? I asked. No, he's in Boston at a surgical conference. Is everything all right? Look, Mrs. Strathmore, I don't know how to say this, but I don't think he is. I just had a confrontation with my wife, and she told me she was going out on a weekend at the Marriott in Kenilworth, ending on Sunday night. What? What are you saying? I think we are both being lied to. I have an email confirmation for the rental of seven adjoining rooms, on the seventh floor, from today through Monday. I saved your number, Mr. Collins. Let me get back to you. I had had enough of this bullshit. I looked on the emergency call list and found the listing for the head of HR at the hospital, Corinne Adams. I knew her. She and my wife were good friends. I knew her husband. He was a police detective sergeant. I dialed her cell. Almost immediately, she answered. Hello? Who is this? Corinne. This is David Collins, Judith's husband. I heard, oh, shit, under her breath. Yes, Dave, what can I do for you? Definitely rattled. I think there are some improprieties going on between Dr. Strathmore and my wife, and I want it investigated and stopped. I'm sorry, Dave, I can't talk now. I have to go. Click. Wow, that was weird. Almost instantly, Judith's cell phone rang. On the third ring, with my stomach churning, I answered it. Without waiting for me to say anything, the caller started. Judith, he knows. He knows. Everything. What did you say to him? Then I shit on her parade. Not everything, Corinne. But I'm getting closer. 
The shrieking gasp for breath on the other end was most enlightening. Goodbye. Click. I immediately looked up her home phone and dialed it. For rings and a man answered. Look, I don't want to upgrade my cable service. Jerry, it sounds like you're having a bad day. Who is this? Dave Collins, Judith's husband. Yeah, nothing but sales calls and spam. What's up, Dave? Is Corinne at home? Nah, I'm babysitting this weekend. Curran's at a team building weekend sponsored by the hospital, down in Philly. Why do you ask? I took a deep breath and told him everything I had learned and suspected. And I suspect there are more than the three of them involved. There was silence on the other end. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? I don't know what I'm thinking. But I know one thing. She isn't leaving here tonight, even if I wind up in jail. I'll get back to you if I find out anything. Don't do anything stupid. Jerry was a cop, and I could hear the wheels turning. Then Judith came down the stairs looking like a high-priced call girl. Red silk sheath dress. Cleavage almost to her waist and split up the right side. Clear to mid-thigh. She saw her pocketbook dumped on the table. What the hell? I have to leave here, and you dumped all my stuff out. She started to pick everything up, and I shouted, Oh, and oh, you don't. You're not going anywhere. Now shut up and sit down. She quailed and said, You don't owe me. I can do anything I want to. Is that a fact? Well, then, so can I. How's this? I reached up and grabbed the plunging neckline on her dress, ripping it downwards. Suddenly she was basically naked, standing in her open cup bra, French lace garter belt, and her lace top smoky gray seam stockings. She screamed and wailed, my dress. No, which, it's not your dress. I bought it for our 25th wedding anniversary, along with most of the underwear you're almost wearing. If you're going anywhere tonight, it won't be in that dress. Then my cell phone rang. Hello, Dave Collins? This is Mary Strathmore. I'm sorry to tell you, you were right. I called the police and reported the car stolen. I had bought it for him, and it was registered in my name. They pulled him over about five minutes ago. He claimed that he was my husband and that he had a right to drive the car. Through a strained voice, she chuckled. They called me from the spot of the traffic stop and told me what he said. That he was my husband. I could hear him in the background when I told the cops it was impossible. My husband was in Boston. The creep gasped and said he wanted a lawyer. I have to go down and fix the mess. He has been arrested and the car impounded. Tell your wife I'm coming for her next. We had been on speakerphone as soon as I realized who it was. Judith gasped and screamed. What did you do, David? Damn you. Right about that time, my children showed up and blew through the front door. Dad, what's going? Mom, are you all right? Said Dave Jr., number one son. My daughter Haley rushed in and went to her mother's side. Are you all right, mother? What happened to your dress? Your father ripped it. All eyes turned to me with murder in their hearts. I was not about to be cowed by this. Michael, son number two, shut the front door. What the hell, mom? What did you do? Tell them why, Judith. Go ahead. Why do you have a 12-pack of Trojan condoms in your purse? Are you going to make water balloons, or what? I don't know where they came from. They aren't mine, Judith said in an almost unhearable voice. And where were you going? A weekend of sexual excess without your husband. Isn't that what you had in mind? I can do what I want to. It's my body. As soon as it came out, Judith realized what she had said in front of her children. In a more subdued voice, she said, Well, I can't. Young Dave rolled his eyes and went into the kitchen for something to drink. A few minutes later, he returned with an envelope. Here, Dad. It's addressed to you. He looked at his mother with contempt on his face. Judah shrieked and came up off the couch, the remains of her dress falling to the floor. Don't read that, she yelled. Haley rushed to help her mother with her lack of modesty. Shut up, Judith, and sit back down. I said, I opened the envelope and read, My darling husband, my sister is caring for mother and needs some help. I am going to be with him this weekend and will be home on Monday evening. Kisses and hugs, Judith. The kids looked at each other and didn't know what to think. I realized she had written the note before she had confronted me. Her confusion and panic would be her downfall. Then, as if the fates were eating popcorn and watching the show, the front doorbell rang, and before number two son Michael could open it, and rushed Judith's mother and father. Judith, are you all right? Said her mother. Her father roared. What's going on here? Judith passed out. Hi, mom and dad. Welcome to Shitstorm Central. Your daughter just managed to destroy our marriage and probably ruin her life and career, I fumed. Her mother and my daughter were trying to revive Judith, and her father was doing a slow burn. I brought them up to date on what had transpired, 
and the atmosphere got colder and colder. About then, Judith came too and looked around. In hysterics, she begged her mother to help her. Help? You want help? How about we call your sister for help? You are going to help her with your mother. Maybe she can return the favor. With that, I handed her father the note and dialed her sister. As he read it, the phone rang. Hello? Is this David? Yes, Mavis. How's it going? How is mom doing? Is she all right? Oh, yes, she's doing fine. Judith is really a big help. I don't know what I would have done without her. Can I talk to her, please? I asked. Oh, well, she's busy right now. How about if I have her call you back in a little bit? Mom grabbed the phone and snarled at her other daughter. That won't be necessary, you simpering shithead. Mom, screamed her hysterical sister. Judith broke down again and tumbled to the floor. She now was almost totally naked in front of her children and her parents. Don't bother checking on my health again, Mavis. She ended the call amidst strangled screams from daughter number two. About that time, my phone rang again. Hello? I answered. David? This is Jerry. He sounded like I felt. You were right. I got a search warrant for the seven rooms at the Marriott. We raided them based on the missing persons warrant I had sworn out and found 12 other individuals, including my wife, three male doctors, four female doctors, four female nurses, and one other female HR team member, and my wife. I'm sorry, Dave. Really sorry. So am I, Jerry. But it is what it is. Thank you. I turned to my soon-to-be ex-wife. Get upstairs and put some decent clothes on. Then get out of my house. She dragged her sniveling bum to a standing position and turned to go upstairs. She stopped and said, Please don't throw me away like this. Oh, you mean like you threw our marriage away with your, it's my body, I'll do what I want bullshit? I have been tempted like you wouldn't believe. I could have screwed the little waitress at the diner where we used to have coffee after the night shift. I could have had the woman at the Lincoln dealership where we bought the car. Hell, your own sister even came on to me. But I was in love with you, which... And this is the thanks I get. Get out of my life, which she totally lost it and turned and fled upstairs, losing one high-heeled shoe in the trip. Silence ensued in the living room. Then my daughter said, I'll go make sure she doesn't do anything stupid, daddy. Otherwise, I won't be able to be disappointed with her for the rest of my life. She came downstairs about 30 minutes later with a suitcase, dressed in jeans and a sweatshirt. Her makeup and hair were a disaster. My oldest son stopped her on her way out. Don't worry, mother. Adrian and I will schedule the wedding so that it won't interfere with one of your sex fests. Not that you'll get an invitation. Maybe dad can bring a new girlfriend. Adrian was Dave's serious girlfriend, but we didn't know how serious. Until now. Judith had stopped at the front door and lost it. Her mother ushered her out. Her father turned to me. Anyway past all this? She obviously needs some help, but it doesn't seem like anything happened. She can talk to my lawyer about it. Remember, son. She loves you. I looked him square in the eye and said, funny way of showing it. The funny thing was that they all threw the same shit out. Consenting adults, not doing anything wrong, until they got caught. Then it came to light that the good doctor had used a company, hospital, credit card to rent the rooms and pay for the booze and food for the weekend party. The hospital tried to dodge the publicity, but eight of the participants were listed as being on the clock or at some bogus official seminar or hospital function. When this came to light, several marriages exploded. This was not the first party, but it sure was going to be the last. I filed for divorce, but I'm basically a mild-mannered aircraft mechanic. Remember? And I loved her more than my luggage, as the movie line goes. So, I let it drag while she went to counseling. The kids were there for me and thought that at least I was making an effort. But it hurt so much, and it just came out of the blue. How could I have been so blind? United Airlines was very sympathetic, and I got extended medical leave. She lost her job, along with everyone else involved. The good doctor was let go, and then sued and prosecuted. Corinne lost her job, as did her number two. A severe nursing shortage occurred, and several doctor's positions opened up. My wife was the last recruited member of the sex club, as they were looking for some fresh meat. She had been noticed for quite a while, and Corinne worked on her, saying she owed it to herself, that it was a lot of fun, I would never know, and... Besides, lots of husbands got off on their wives screwing other men. It took six months, but they finally convinced her. It took more than a year, but I got divorced. I sued the hospital and Dr. Strathmore. I had to get in line behind his wife's divorce suit, but I was ahead of the other aggrieved parties. Between the two of us, we cleaned him out. 
I took my settlement and divided it equally amongst the remaining husbands and wives. The hospital was not so lucky. We settled out of court for six figures in a sealed settlement. The rest of the plaintiffs got a total of seven figures in sealed reparations. My sister-in-law was not welcome anywhere. I don't know if her parents talked to her yet. I was lucky with the outcome, the way it all came out. The fact that my mind hit on all eight cylinders during the whole incident. And the support of my kids and my friends. I didn't think I had taken my marriage for granted, but maybe I did. About eight months into the shitstorm, I braced the doctor coming out of a gym he attends. I beat the living dog shit out of him, breaking three, count three, fingers and crushing one of his balls. His good looks no longer exist. Lucky for me, I was in the company of a police officer at the time. So, life goes on. I informed him that he should have worked for a living. Maybe he could have put up a better fight. Yeah, I know, very tacky. Tough. Don't mess with my wife, and I will remain mild-mannered. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.